Welcome back to my Nostalgia Games. It's high time we return to the Commodore Amiga now, because in the first episode, I think the only game that I mentioned from my earliest Amiga gaming days was Emerald Mine. And that's because I really hadn't really figured out the actual form of the series. So, let's continue where I left off. One of the very first games that I ever got to play on an Amiga was a fairly unknown crosshair shooter called Take Em Out, developed by a Swedish team, Psychon. Historically, the most interesting thing about this game is perhaps that it was published by Artronic, who were earlier known as Cascade Games. And while being Artronic, they ultimately went bankrupt and closed their doors in 1990. For me, Take Em Out was the first first-person crosshair shooter game that I ever got to play at all, but that I was controlled with a mouse was all the more mind-blowing for me at the age of nine. First, you must pass the practice round at a shooting range before you get into real action. Even though it's a practice round, you still need to gather a certain amount of points to pass it, a recurring objective throughout the game. After that, you get to choose your weapons for both mouse buttons from a range of four weapons, a rifle, a machine gun, a bazooka and hand grenades. The later levels feature all sorts of targets that you need to see if you have to shoot them or avoid shooting them, and there are even some bonus shootables that might not be worth the trouble since you get a very limited amount of bullets for each level. All in all, Take Em Out is not a very player-friendly shooter since it requires some experimentation even in the first stage. It's also a very fast-paced game, so having a mouse as the controller isn't nearly quick enough for most of the time, but it's definitely better than a joystick. Being one of my first Amiga experiences, it's definitely high on the nostalgia value for me, and good for a few minutes of blasting. Pac-Mania is another one from my series of first Amiga experiences. I was never a particularly huge fan of the original Pac-Man and most of its immediate variants, but Pac-Mania brought on an isometric view, different mazes and jumping. But when I saw the game for the first time on the Amiga, I was immediately hooked on all the new colorful graphics and amazing music, which still sound pretty good. In concept, there's nothing particularly different in Pac-Mania to the original games. But the zoomed-in scrolling screen is much more intense to follow than seeing your ghostly enemies constantly. As its predecessors, Pac-Mania was originally an arcade game, so the arcade sense of progression is translated naturally for the home conversions. After all these years, what continues to stun me the most is that back in the day, I didn't take much of interest in who were responsible for creating or porting all these games, and I realized this interest wasn't fully aroused until the age of emulation came along. It was only within the last few years that I learned that Peter Harrop and Sean Hollingworth of old Gremlin days were both credited as programmers for most of the home conversions of Pac-Mania and Ben Daglish as the musician. This game acts as a good personal reminder of how important it often is to know the people behind your favorite games, and it's all the more reason to revisit this game more often now but I'd do that only on the Amiga, because that's where I first played it. If you've been listening to Retro Game Talk Show or reading my blog from its earliest entries, you might be aware of my slight obsession about Jeff Crammon's legendary stunt car racer. Until the early 2000s, there was nothing like it on the market, and unless you count the Trackmania series as close enough, there still isn't. What we have here is a first-person racing game that takes place on strange roller coaster like tracks, way above the ground level. There are jumps, gaps and hard tilted curves to drive through, and you need to learn all the 8 tracks in the game just as diligently as you would in any proper racing simulator. The game progresses in divisions of 2 tracks and 3 racers each time, and you need to race each of the 2 tracks in each division twice to gather up points for wins and best laps to get promoted to the next division. Lose badly enough and you get demoted to the lower division. Your car can handle some damage, but mess up too badly too often and your car will become too vulnerable for racing, so it can get very intense. Happily there's a save and load feature in the game, which was a rare thing to have back in the day, so you could load up a save point if you crashed too badly or got demoted. 
get through all four divisions and you get to Super League in which you get to race a more powerful car against more difficult competitors. Stunt Car Racer was also ahead of its time in a way. You were able to connect two Amigas or Ataris or PCs with a null modem cable to race against your friends. I don't know anyone who would have been able to do that, but it's an interesting thought. Still, the single player mode offered enough of a challenge to last a good while, and it's still worth playing because of its uniqueness on any platform it was released on, but my choice will most likely be on the Amiga, because that's the platform I played it first on, and that's where it feels the best. For a less biased look at the game on all the platforms, check out my blog entry from August 2013. The link is below in the video description. Some of the games that I got to play in the early Amiga days were bundled with the Amigas my friends bought. The usual starter pack would feature several games, more of which I will get into in later episodes, but this time I will mention Broderband's classic edutainment game, Where in the World is Carmen San Diego, based on an American children's quiz show and originally released on the Apple II, like most Broderband games were. The Amiga version was released in 1989, but due to the point-and-click sleuthing style the games played in, the age didn't really show. And besides, there was nothing else really quite like it around that time. At least, nothing I knew about. Of course, I will have to admit that being a 9 or 10 year old kid at the time, I didn't really understand nearly everything in the game necessary for making progress. But a slightly childish sense of suspense, shady characters and beautiful illustrations of places around the world dragged me in little by little. The entire Carmen San Diego series shows how exactly edutainment in the old days was made interesting and fun. And there's something game developers could still learn from this series. The world is big enough to start from, but if you're interested in this sort of a thing, I also recommend the sequels Where in Europe, Where in the USA and Where in Time is Carmen San Diego. High replay value and at least in my case high nostalgic value too. Our final game for this episode should be a fairly familiar name for games of all retro platforms, apart from the Sega consoles. Hostages from Infogrames was released as Rescue the Embassy Mission on some platforms in some areas, but Hostages is the original title and to me it shall always remain the only proper one. You are in charge of the terrorist intervention combat team and you need to place a group of marksmen to certain designated spots on the streets, then get a team of specialist paratroopers onto the roof of the infiltrated embassy. Ease the paratroopers way into the building by shooting some terrorist silhouettes and windows and then the parachutists can enter the embassy through windows using a rope. Finally kill all the terrorists when necessary Rescue the hostages from the building and get out alive. Doesn't sound too easy and trust me, it really isn't. But making the attempt gives so much variety to the gameplay that it's more fun to play than actually complete the mission. Avoiding the lights in level 1 by hiding behind walls and windows is ridiculously intense. Sharpshooting the silhouettes in level 2 is a necessary evil but the sound effects make up for the otherwise monotonous gameplay. And wandering around in the embassy building and killing terrorists is often as intense as any good shooter. The game has many difficulty levels to choose from, but even on its easiest mode, there is enough of a challenge to get you raging for a few months. Hostages is a curious combination of being somewhat ahead of its time and being already outdated to some extent, but for all its pros and cons, it's certainly a product of its time and a good consideration for any nostalgia trip. For me, this is definitely an Amiga game.